Welcome to the Big Success Podcast, cutting edge conversations on business and personal success, as well as how to level up. Here's your host, number one business coach in the world, Brad Sugars. You're going to love today's episode because Mike just drops idea after idea after idea after idea. There's so many little things. It's like I'm sitting here thinking, oh my God, I can cut this into a million reels because he's just dropping little notes and nuggets. Get a pen and paper ready. Now, to give you a background, Mike, uh, all the books he's written, Profit First, his Profit First system is amazing. It's used across the world. Clockwork, his new book, All In on Teams. Uh, he's bought, built and sold companies, sold them out to fortune 500 companies, sold them out to that young entrepreneur of the year, but amazing teacher who has a passion for helping entrepreneurs achieve their success. Let's dive in, talk success with Mike. So Mike, first question, what is success in your mind? How do you define it? You know, I think success is, um, being joyful in our experience, uh, in life. And so uh, it, to me is in part is achieving goals I've set for myself that I think mm. will bring that joy. It's funny, I, you know, I thought back in the day, success will translate directly to money and I, I no longer believe that. But I do believe that I do have certain lifestyle standards or something that I want to achieve and that yeah. money is, is a component to it. Um, but at the end of the day, I consider if, a success, if I had a successful day, did I, do I feel joyful and satisfied? Ultimately, ultimately, the biggest measurement I've noticed for myself is a measurement of my impact on others. So did I put my best out there that was of service to other folks? And, and that honestly feels like the biggest success of all for me. Yeah, look, I, I go back to that early days thing because there's a lot of young people on the podcast and they're, they're in that mindset and they're like, well, it's easy for you to think about joy. You've already made the money type right. thing. <laughs> how, how did you transition from the 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 money thing to the joy thing. What led to that? I, I found there's a certain point. So I, I was the, the greed is good guy. Like, you know, yeah. making money gives me joy, man. I'm going to make yeah, let's all read, of it. Let's read the title of every one of Mike's books and see if he likes money. Profit <laughs> first. <you know? laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so money is a necessity to support uh, the impact you can have in the world and, and uh, a lifestyle you want to achieve. I do know this. The lack of money is problematic, and I have experienced that deeply. When I didn't have mm. money, I needed money to, to support a basic lifestyle. So unless you achieve a basic lifestyle, but I've also have experienced far more than uh, the money necessary for a, a basic, comfortable lifestyle, and I found that the joy factor starts to fade away. Um, it, it then becomes, oh, it's about having impact on others. Oh, money is a source for impact. And when you have impact on others, a positive impact on others, more money will come through that when structured properly to support more impact and becomes this kind of perpetual motion machine. So I, I agree, there's an, a basic level you need to achieve, but at least for me, it wasn't millions or billions, which I thought it would be. Um, it was actually a much lower level before I shifted to success is impact. Yeah, it's kind of crazy because like just here in the U.S., you've got, uh, I think it's 82% of people will never make more than, well, are at this stage, not making more than 100 percent, 100 grand a year. And you've got 66 or 65% of families not doing more than 100 grand a year. And I think that if people can get to 100, 200 grand, like they're way above the average bear sort yeah, of true. thing, you know? So- when when do you feel in your life you chose success? Was it as a young man? It was a where, where did success become? Yes, I'm going to be successful. Oh, very early on, but not in the entrepreneurial sense. Um, I just I just felt compelled to to live a certain standard of life, and I'm, I'm not even saying uh, quality of, of a house or something. Like that. I'm just, I'm saying like yeah, yeah. a certain standard that I a, a reputation almost, and. Um, that came early on. I never knew the pathway would be entrepreneurship. In fact, I thought I'd be a career person for a large corporation. I just couldn't get the job. And if I did, I bet you I'd still be there today doing that work. Um, the definition then changed though. So it was about in the early stages, I wanted to have, imp not impact, but I wanted to have a certain standard. And I thought money was the only vehicle. It's over time that at least my thoughts have expanded. Oh, it's not about that. It's about all these different aspects of life. I did an exercise maybe 10 years ago called the life wheel. You may have done this where you rate yourself financially, you rate yourself physically, health-wise. 
And if it's unbalanced, you're unbalanced. And yeah. I was like, wow, um, there's some areas I got to take care of spiritual, um, physical. And uh, once I started doing that, the expansion wheel of success expanded out. Yeah, look, I, I think at some point, and, and I'd be getting your interest on this. At some point, we realized that chasing money doesn't lead to money. Delivering value leads to money. Delivering great service, delivering all those things. What's what's the Mike formula for success? Like, how do you see that success happens for someone? Or even how did you make it happen for you? So I, I'm going to rip one off from Pitbull, the lyricist of the century. He says, uh, ask for money, get advice. Ask for advice, get money twice. And I'm like, oh, that's it, man. That's it. Our, the impact we can have comes from a desire, a thirst to learn, observe, and then repackage. So all the work I do, uh, admittedly, is nothing new. Profit first, the system is nothing new, clockwork. I've taken all these ideas. I, I consider myself not a great creator as much as a great curator. But then when I take all these ideas, I'm like, okay, I'm it in a new way that's digestible uh, to people in, in, a, in a more efficient way or whatever, and repackage it. And that has amplified all of my, or many aspects of my success wheel, if you will. So that's what yeah. I invite people to do. If you're seeking success, how can you be of great service to others by being a great gainer of knowledge, a great curator, and then repackaging that to serve people in a more efficient, better way? What, what's been your favorite way to learn and, and grow? Is it mentors? Is it books? What's your favorite way? Yeah, probably my favorite is is uh, masterminding, one-on-one uh, I shouldn't say one-on-one, peer-to-peer groups. So this is where there's no g- guru or, or genius in the room. Everyone has equal say, and you put a challenge on the table, and then you have five or six people tackling this challenge with different perspectives. Here, I found that the more diverse the group is, the strong, the more diverse the backgrounds, the more diverse the, their religious beliefs, the more diverse everything, that yeah. we actually get better ideas. I, I don't want eight mics in the room saying this is what we should do because it's just confirming what I already know to be my truth, but not the <laughs> truth. You know, I want I want perspective. That's always yeah. been the best for me. If they all agree with you all the time, one of them is useless. I think that's that's a definite factor. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So that's true. in your mind, what's the relationship between failure and success? How do they work together? Failure sucks, but God, is it necessary for success, right? It's a yin and yang. Some of my biggest failures, I wouldn't wish upon my worst enemy. Yeah. Uh, and yet, in retrospect, I'm like, that was the most important experience of my life. I did this exercise called the lifeline. You kind of draw out your life and the highs and lows. I noticed that many of the lows at the moment have become my biggest highs because that became profound awareness for me or a whole new realization. I, I remember the analogy, um, someone told me the best way to help someone who smokes to stop smoking is for them to have a heart attack. And they said, the reason that's the most impactful is everyone knows that you shouldn't smoke. We all know the harms, but until you experience it yourself, do you see that you can be impacted by it yourself? Yeah. So those proverbial heart attacks, those failures, have been so important to achieve success. So what Um, mindset does it take to make that a reality though? Because you know, there's some people that they have the failure and then they define themselves that way. How does the mindset, how does your mind work that it leads you to success? You know, I think ultimately for me, it's, it came to be saying, what else could this mean? So in the moment, when I have failures, I, yeah. I collapsed a big business. I lost all our money, all those things. In the moment, I'm like, I suck. I'm not even worthy of being on this planet. You know, like all these like negative things. And I think, first of all, it's okay to feel that. It's okay to let that emotion roll through. At a certain point, though, we have to make a decision saying, okay, I'm done lamenting myself. There's nothing else that I'm going to get any value out of this. That's out. Can I look back at this situation and say, is there something to learn or gain from this? And for me, it doesn't necessarily happen like the next morning. It could be months or years later, or maybe a decade (laughs) or a decade. But when we start looking back at these stories, there's lessons there. And sometimes there's multiple lessons that come out over time. So just what else could this mean? What can I learn from this? How can this be of service to me? Sometimes, at least for me, I find the answers there. Yeah, and I, I sometimes find it takes an outside perspective. If you had to use outsiders to help you get out of your own head, and what's your experience there? 
Yeah, I have. And that, that's painful sometimes because they're saying the honest truth I don't want to hear. I remember once I was, on a, <laughs> I was on a call with a mastermind. I can't remember even what the struggle was, but something didn't work out. I didn't acquire a client or something. Her name was Christina Harbridge. She, she stops the call. She goes, hey, Mike. She goes, are you done being a martyr yet? And I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, I've seen you in these situations and you simply are a martyr. And it was brutal. She slapped me in the face. She goes, listen, I mean, proverbially, <laughs> but she goes, you actually are getting some kind of satisfaction by saying, oh, I failed again. Look at me. Woe is me. She goes, are you done? Because that's holding you back. And that's the first time I ever faced it. Say, oh my God, I use martyrdom a lot as a tool to protect myself, but I'm not moving myself forward. I'm not serving anyone. I'm just building a nonsense story. So that was a powerful way of opening my eyes. Gotta love mastermind groups when they actually point it out straight. Oh my God, like, it was the elephant in the room. And, and you know, other people were afraid to say it. That's the power of diversity. Not everyone's gonna be comfortable saying their observed truth of you, and that's okay too. But if you have a diverse group, someone, it's gonna trigger them enough to raise their hand and say, you're done. This is the problem. And the rest of the group is sitting there nodding, saying, yep, Mike, that's, that's you, that's you. I'm like, why, why doesn't anyone tell me this? They're like, we're telling you now, it's you. And so I've tried to scratch it off my list of go-to mechanisms. <laughs> You're on the Big Success Podcast. We're going to be back in just a moment. We're going to talk about clockwork, getting your business to run without you, profit first, and leadership and team. Serious income success for you will come through Brad Sugar's scalability event, massive business growth, and understanding how you turn your business into a commercial, profitable enterprise that works for you so that you don't have to. Visit bradsugars.com to attend this program as a standalone or as part of Brad Sugars' Entrepreneurial University. And we're back. Mike, I got to ask, you wrote Profit First. You talk about permanently profitable. Give me the inside track. What are the top things I got to know to make sure profit is the thing that's happening? Yeah, so Profit First is a cash management tool. And the essence is what we need to do is set up accounts at our bank. It's a behavioral intercept. When I speak with entrepreneurs, I'll ask, you know, how do you manage your books? Do you use your accounting system? Do you use a spreadsheet? And they say, well, not really. My method is I log into my bank account. And if I have money, I spend it. If I don't, I panic. So I'm like, okay, that's normal. That's what I do too. We need a system at our bank. So profit first, we set up multiple accounts where we allocate money to its intended use. It used to be $1,000 came in, I got $1,000 to spend, no more. $1,000 comes in, we're gonna move some of it to profit, some of it to pay you a salary, which is different than profit, taxes, so forth, operating expenses. Now you realize for your operating expenses, you don't have $1,000 at deposit, you may have $500 and that's what you must live off of. It's the envelope system applied to business. That's how yeah. Profit First works essentially. You know, so when you think about that, it takes some discipline though. What's the mindset to get to that discipline or is there an automated way of doing that? Yeah, you, you can audit Automate it. Um, and this is very pluggy of me, but there's a bank we work with I love. It's called Relay. It's an online banking platform. You can go to banklikemike.com. I set up a short URL. So that's my pluggy part if you want to check it out. But I think everyone, every business owner should start by doing this at your own bank if it's easier yeah. and do it yourself. We, I have a technique I say start slow and let it then grow. Meaning start by saying one account. In the profit first deployment, we suggest multiple accounts, um, the foundational five and so forth. But it can be overwhelming if you've never done anything like this before. Starting today, allocate 1% of any deposits into a brand new account called Profit because you won't have any negative impact on how you're currently operating your business. It's 1%. But you'll see profit accumulating. And that 1% over time may become two or four or seven, or whatever. It will grow and then you'll deploy the whole system. And then you can go to banklikemike.com and set it up. <laughs> so to get great profit, though, we need great people. One of the things that uh, I love the way you teach about recruiting and retaining and how retaining starts right at recruiting. Tell us more about some of the things that a great business does to recruit and retain the best. So I have invested the last five or six years researching this out, and I have a brand new book coming out specifically on this technique, but I want to share it now, is most businesses do interviewing and the results are atrocious. The results of, of finding a, a well-suited employee. So I said, okay, that's not working. Great. We, most of us know interviews kind of suck. What's the alternative? There is a near trillion dollar industry that recruits differently and is very successful. It's the sports industry. Mm. And what the sports industry does is they run camps 
And we can for our business too. I'll give you an example, a personal example. I played sports in high school. I wasn't necessarily a particularly good athlete, but I played lacrosse. Well, I went to a camp, um, a college camp that was teaching these 300 students to get better. As we were being taught, a few of the kids, not me, but a few were tapped on the shoulder and uh, were brought to another field because they were the better athletes and were demonstrating skills which could be enhanced even further. Ultimately, some of those kids were tapped on the shoulder and recruited to play at that university. The beautiful thing is the university, it was called Hobart, found their two or three best players and all 300 of us got better. I ended up playing in college in part because of that camp and what I learned there. We can run a camp for our business. Everyone gets elevated and you cherry pick the few. And I'll give you just a real quick business example. Home Depot does this. Next time you see one of their build a birdhouse workshop or whatever, it's a recruiting camp. What they do is you go there with some kids, you start building a birdhouse. Uh, and during the experience, hopefully you get ingratiated with, with uh, Home Depot, you like them, you wanna buy from them. Additionally, they have coaches there, Home Depot employees who are watching the greatest participants. Who's showing the most interest? Who's helping other parents? They will tap you on the shoulder to go to the other field and say, hey, would you ever consider working at Home Depot? You show such a talent in this space. It's a recruiting platform. Yeah. Run a camp. Yeah. I One of my great friends in Australia, Steve Ackery, has for 30 years run the best hairdressing school in Australia purely because he has 150 hairdressing salons. And it's like, how do they get a job? Well, we have 100% recruitment if you pass. You know, 100% of our students get placed in a job. It's brilliant. So, it's brilliant. You know, when... The mindset shift, though, between hiring and recruiting. Talk to me more about that. Yeah, so recruiting is where we are attracting a, an audience. Hiring is where we actually make the transaction to commitment. So a, a really cool uh, recruiting mechanism is deployed by a company called Audible, and I, I feature that in the book too. Audible is doing a thing called returnships, not internships, but returnships. They went out to a community that said, if you uh, have been laid off from work or, or not been active in work because of health concerns or something for an extended period over a year, but want to re-enter the workforce, uh, we have a program called a returnship. Recruiting is speaking to a community uh, that you may be able to ultimately hire from and speaking to their specific needs. They said, we're going to uh, retrain you on, on new professional standards and so forth. As people go through these returnship programs, then they go into a hiring mode. They say, if these people yeah. going through this program, who are best suited, uh, let's meet with them, see what they need uh, for an offer and what we can structure, and they do it. So recruiting is the community, engaging a community, hiring is selecting uh, the right fits from that community. Fantastic, fantastic. So that then leads me to uh, another theory, another micism is like, you know, stop doing, start managing type thing. Yeah. Tell me more about that philosophy and how business people can succeed by doing that. You know, Brad, when, when I'm on stage, uh, I'll look at an entrepreneurial group and I'll point right at him. I'll say, the number one job you have, the number one job of entrepreneurs is not to do the job. It's to create jobs. And this comes out of a statistic, um, about 20, not even 17% of the population ever starts a business or builds a business, but only 20% are successful on a sustained basis that means 20% times 17%, 3% of the population runs a healthy, consistent business. 97% of the population is looking for a good job with a good company. So our yeah. job as business owners is to create good companies and to give the opportunity to 97% of the world who's looking for a good job with good companies. So there's not enough good jobs out there. There's not enough good companies out there. You're one of them. So your responsibility is not to do the work. It's to give the work to people who want the work. Yeah. yeah I, I know people... Uh... With us at Action Coach, one of our key metrics is job creation. You know, the businesses we coach, how many jobs did they create during the year is a key metric of ours. We, we love that that's a big thing. So how does a business person transition from doing to managing? What's the mindset shift they got to have? Yeah, so we have to learn the proper form of delegation, but most of us don't know delegation. We, we often revert to one of two standards. It's micromanagement um, or abdication. Micromanagement, there, there's a Hindu goddess named Kali, Brad, and, and this Hindu goddess is one figurehead with eight arms. And that's what all most right. business, yeah, and that's what most businesses become. It's one person, the business owner, making all the decisions. And that's why most businesses will never have more than two, maybe three employees because all decisions flow through one spot. That's micromanagement. 
Abdication is you assign something to someone and say, just take care of this. And then we come back and we're frustrated because it didn't achieve the outcome we expected because we never defined the outcome. Proper delegation is outcome assignment. Basically, it says, here's where I think we should go. Do you, my colleague, agree this is where we should go? What's the reason we should achieve this? And what's the way to get there? Now, you as a corporation will have best practices. Our job is to tell our colleague, here's the best practice to get here, but you must navigate the path, even if it's not following your best practice, particularly if you find a new way to get there, just get us to the outcome. And the last thing is this, and the best part about delegation or the most important part is when you assign an outcome and you've agreed upon it, have that employee teach the system they then are implementing back to another colleague at the company within a few weeks of being assigned this outcome. The reason is the best student is always the teacher. When you know that someone that's assigned with an outcome can teach it, you know they've mastered it. Dang, we build all that. You've done it a couple of times. How Most business people ultimately are aiming to at some point build something they can either pass on or sell. Let's yeah. focus on the sell just for a second. What are some of the keys that you've learned in selling businesses to get a great transaction or to build something that is saleable at least? You know, the, the number one thing is if it needs you, it ain't sellable, at least not at a high valuation. Because think about the transaction. When I sold my companies, the people acquiring my company knew I didn't want to be in the business anymore to some degree because I was selling it. I, mm. I wanted some form of out. So they're saying, okay, the guy who the company depends on is leaving. Oh, there's no value to this company. The number one determinant of a value of a company is that it does not have dependency on the owner. And the, here's the irony. If it has no dependency on you, I, I've been going admittedly to McDonald's pretty frequently when I travel. I've been asking the cashier, may I meet with the owner? The owner's never been to any of these McDonald's I've gone to, which makes yeah. it a very viable acquisition target. Because if I buy at McDonald's, I don't have to worry about the owner. It's plug and play. So the number one thing is if it depends on you, it's not necessarily sellable, at least not for a good valuation. And the irony is if it doesn't depend on you, now you have a cash ATM, you're not motivated to sell, which increases the valuation further because someone really better persuade you. The second component is proven profitability. If your business, quarter in, quarter out, has sustained growing profitability on a cash basis, meaning not just a recasted accounting firm, form, anyone can recast that, Enron, recasted their accounting to be profitable even when they're collapsing. But if you can show on a cash basis accumulating profit, that's another definition of a cash ATM, increases your valuation. Those two things together is the best way to increase any business's valuation. You're on the Big Success Podcast, Mike Michalowicz. He's our guest. We're going to talk scaling up when we return. Mike Michalowicz is the entrepreneur behind three multi-million dollar companies and is the author of several business books, including Profit First, Clockwork, The Pumpkin Plan, and his newest book, All In. To learn more about Mike Michalowicz, please visit MikeMichalowicz.com. And we're back. Big success is coming your way. Mike, what's the difference between a business that does good and a business that goes great, that scales? Inevitably, the businesses that do great, from my observation, is they become a specialist in something within their business. I, I think of Zappos right away. Yeah, Zappos delivered shoes, and so does so many other businesses. But Zappos had a theme of delivering happiness. I think, really, they only did about one or two things differently, but they did it perfectly. They would set an expectation. Your package of new shoes will arrive on Friday when you order on Sunday. And then they would FedEx it overnight, and you get it on a Monday or Tuesday you were delighted because you got something earlier than expected. It was expectation management and they became so good at it, the company exploded. Yeah. Every business I see that's successful figures out something that they're gonna be the world's best at and delivers on that. So when you look at uh, the difference between a mindset then, company that goes for a, a million dollar goal versus a company that goes for a hundred million or a billion dollar goal. What's the difference in that business owner? You've coached a lot of people through that. What's the difference in mindset? Yeah. Well, the million dollar business owner often says, well, I'm a key part of this. It, it depends on me. And they become a crutch for the business. You know, the biggest mistake I see, Brad, is these businesses uh, owners say, well, I'm a free resource. The second you see yourself as a free resource, you've put a crutch into the business, a artificial dependency that will never free the business from that. You are not a free resource. You are an employee just like everyone else. You just happen to also own the company, but the company must be able to pay you accordingly. These $100 million companies um, simply say, how do I serve a need 
without me actively doing it? And how can I do it on a replicatable basis? How can I duplicate the solution over and over again? So the only way to properly duplicate a solution is if you have the same problem. They focus on a specific need that has the same solution needed over and over again, and then they just put it on over speed or overdrive. Let's let's dive into that replicatable just for a minute. When when I see massive companies, they're not a billion dollar one location company. They're a thousand million dollar locations or, or, or that. So dive into that replicatable thing for me. What's the key factors around that? Yeah. So Michael Gerber talked about this in his work is every business oh, yeah. should follow, you know, yeah, every business should follow a franchise model. And so, you know, we referred to McDonald's earlier. What's so impressive about McDonald's is the exact same thing over and over. And as one location grows, it actually serves the other locations because that awareness propagates. Well, that's what we need to do with our business to say, how do we treat this as a franchise? If someone else was to come in and buy a location, what are the systems and processes they would need? You don't have to be a franchise, just use that franchise concept. Yeah. So let's think about then allowing ourselves to think that big. All right. There's, there's plenty of people you've met who've thought this level. What's the difference between someone who thinks at that level and someone who allows themselves to think at that hundred or billion type level? Brad, I, I wonder, Brad, if it's the same for you, because uh, I see it's almost everyone. It's it's purpose, but big purpose. I'll, I'll show you something on my screen here. I don't know if my camera will come unplugged, but there it says eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. I'm in my office right now. I have that in my house. I have it everywhere I go. It is a calling for me. And what we do, what I did is at least I look back at my life's history and there is some painful parts around business and I call it entrepreneurial poverty now where, where I was putting myself out one way, but I was really experiencing something else and that gap of wanting to be successful and not, I call entrepreneurial poverty. It was so painful. I said to myself, I will never allow that to happen to myself again or anyone else that I can come into contact with. That became a calling and that becomes very motivational. For many business owners, as they grow, there's a certain point where you are satiated in your financial income or the other tangible aspects you want. I can't satiate that purpose. And that's why it just keeps driving me and driving me. So I invite everyone to explore their life history, see what purpose you can reveal, deploy that through your business, and then you become unstoppable, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I know with my team at Action Coach, when we wrote the vision of world abundance through business re-education, it just became a thing. And it's like we work in cooperation with guys like you, everyone, because we all lift, you know, everyone helps lift the entrepreneurial spirit and the and the success. But a quick, short, sharp question, short, sharp answers. What's the key to success on these things? Number one, uh, health. What's key to success in health? Uh, wake up early and exercise with no excuses. No one has an excuse for not working out at least five minutes per day. Uh, key to success on self-development. Curiosity. My God, if you just leverage curiosity, you will constantly learn. Key to success on goals, achieving your goals. Make them big and crazy and then break them down into smaller incremental components. This is a shoot for the stars, hit the moon approach. Uh, key to success on relationships um, is that you will get what you back what you put into it. So be the first to boldly love your partner or or, or support that relationship, and that will be reciprocated. Key to success in having fun, enjoying life. Um, I found that it's truly being expressive of who I am. I love to be goofy. So when I go to my old college football games, I dress up like the biggest clown. And my God, does that give me joy? It attracts like-minded people. So to be your natural self, people will revere the fact you're being that way. Excellent. Love it. All right. Final question. Yeah. What is the best advice you ever got on success or the best quote you ever read on the subject of success? Uh, maybe, uh, maybe the best quote is, it's, it's attributed to Oscar Wilde, be yourself. Everyone else is already taken. Love it. Love it. Uh, author of Profit First, Clockwork, the new book, All In. Dive in, get to the show notes, read everything, study everything. Mike, thanks so much for your time today.
And that's the Big Success Podcast for today. Hopefully you took a lot of notes, learned a whole bunch, and if you need to, go re-listen to it. We dropped a lot of information right there today. Big success is what it's all about. And by the way, if you haven't subscribed, hit that subscribe button so you're here with us every single week on the Big Success Podcast. I'm Brad Sugars. That's BS. Big success is what we're shooting for. Check the show notes for all the links. Make sure you follow through. Keep learning. Keep coming back. Oh, and by the way, share this with any of your friends who you you know are up for success. I'll see you next week on the Big Success Podcast. You've been listening to the Big Success Podcast with the number one business coach in the world, Brad Sugars. To learn more about how to achieve business and personal success, as well as how to level up or listen to past episodes, visit www.bradsugars.com.